Welcome back, folks, to WP Tonic this week in WordPress and SaaS. This is episode 888. Got a fantastic guest. We're going to be talking about all things AI, content, and much more. We've got Dustin Stout, founder of Magi, with us. Um, it should be a great show. We're going to be, like I say, delving deep in the world of AI and content. Um, Dustin is an expert on this, and he's got a startup uh, around providing services in the AI area. So, Dustin, would you like to give us a quick 20, 30 second intro about yourself? Sure. Um, so, uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I've been self employed, working for myself, grinded it out for the last uh, probably closer to 14 years now started as a side hustle building wordpress sites for clients and teaching businesses how to use social media for uh, marketing and that quickly turned into a full-time business for me consulting and uh, learned seo because if you're building websites and attempting to drive traffic through social media naturally you want to find other channels uh, not just you know pursue one channel and seo was obviously the the biggest show in town as far as driving free traffic. So I learned everything I could about SEO, everything I could about social media marketing. And as I was building web websites for clients, my whole goal was to build them a site that actually gets traffic from multiple different uh, marketing channels. So did that for about 12 years and uh, found very quickly that I'm a bit of a perfectionist and uh, scaling a service-based business as a perfectionist is very difficult to do. Because uh, I'm the kind of guy who will spend an hour and a half trying to decide how round should the button be? And um, have we optimized this page enough for Google's latest algorithm? So uh, I moved to creating digital products. Uh, I love working with clients, but I found that I could put my perfectionism to good use in creating a product that helps many people at once. And I can focus on making it as good as possible. So that's where I'm at today. Founded uh, Magi back in uh, late March seeing where the AI industry was going and seeing how great ChatGPT was, but how many shortcomings it had. And uh, I sought out to improve that for businesses. Oh, that's fantastic. Should be a great show. Before we go into the meat and potatoes of the show, I've got a couple of messages from our major sponsors. We will be back in a few moments, folks. Tired of hosting providers that can't handle high traffic loads? Convesio is here to help. Our platform can handle any amount of traffic all without slowing down or crashing. With immediate Slack support, performance optimization, and a team that thrives on resolving technical challenges, your e-commerce business is in safe hands. Learn more about Convesio at Convesio.com. We're coming back, folks. I want to point out, we've got a new sponsor, and he's going to be with us for about a month. It's Omisend. Omisend is an SMS um, service plugin. Um, had a great following in the Shopify area, but is building um, a great solution in the WooCommerce space. Um, we've got a great special offer. We've got three months with 30% off. You can find that and other great offers and a created list of the best plugins by going over to WP Tonic slash WP hyphen tonic slash dot com slash deals. WP hyphen tonic dot com slash deals. And you find Omnisense um, new offer and some other great offers from our other great sponsors. Thank you, Omnisen, for supporting the show. It's much appreciated. So let's go right into it, Dustin. Um, so what do you think Magi solves? What 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 made you decide that you're going the world of SaaS products, you know? Um, you look quite relaxed, but I'm sure trying to build a SaaS product will uh, change that quite rapidly, based on my own experience. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm a bit relaxed. Maybe it's the uh, allergy medication. Um, my allergies have been <laughs> yesterday here in Bakersfield. I live in Southern California, 
Uh, I looked out the window at one point and it looked like I was in the movie Dune. There was just dust blowing everywhere and it just looked it looked bad outside him. So my sinuses have not been having a great couple of days, but it does make for a much better podcast voice if I do say so myself. Oh, right, right, right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but why SaaS? Uh, well, like I said, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Uh, my first uh, soft venture into digital products was actually a WordPress plugin. And um, that's where I discovered that, you know, building digital products is much better for my, you know, how I'm built, because you know, I can really perfect one thing and help many people. Um, and so once I got started on that, I, it was like, you know, I, I'd like to get rid of these clients so that I can help thousands and millions of people instead of, you know, one, one or two people at a time. Uh, but when ChatGPT first came out, you know, I had been kind of searching for my next product to build. Uh, I came off the tail end of a couple failed digital products after leaving my WordPress plugin company back in 2020, had some other ideas. They didn't pan out. Long story short, lost a lot of money and was at a really low point in my career as an entrepreneur. Um, really dark place. And I was just kind of looking. I was like, I, I feel like I, you know, had a season of drought creatively and and uh, entrepreneurially. And I was like, what is that next thing that I can really like bring to the world and help, you know, the people that I've set out to help, which are typically the the creators. They are the content creators, they are the the consultants, the coaches, you know, the builders out there who are creating things in the world. How can I help other creators? And then Chat GPT came around and I had been working with AI for years now with AI copywriting tools, and they always sort of fell short for me. They were all predicated on these templates, and you kind of had to fit your ideas into somebody else's templates. And then the the stress of having to like pick a template from like a thousand different templates to get the right AI output was just daunting. And I think that's why it never really hit mass market. But when ChatGPT hit the scene, it was the, the, there was, it's not just lowering the barrier of entry. There is no barrier of entry. You don't have to search through a thousand mm -hmm. templates. You just talk to the AI, I tell AI, tell it what you want. And it gives it to you. It was magic to me. Um, and that's kind of where the name Magi came from. Uh, it was magical, but you know, instantly as an entrepreneur, I start using a thing and I start to find all the friction points. I'm like, oh, why doesn't it do this? Why doesn't it have that? I wish I could do this other thing. And, and those things just started piling up as I was using ChatGPT prolifically, uh, both personally and for businesses and for some clients that I started taking on at the time. And so, you know, simple things like search and filter, like why can't I just search my old chats and find them, uh, the ones that I made a week ago? There's no search and filter function inside ChatGPT. Why can't I put things into folders? I would love to do that. Why can't I do that with ChatGPT? Why can't I just give it a URL and it goes to that specific URL and, and scrape the page? Why can't I feed it a YouTube video and have it just know to pull the YouTube transcript? Um, so all these things started piling up and I was like, you know what? I know how to build uh, and I have no other products that are successful right now. So this might be the next thing, the next problem I can solve. I can make ChatGPT better. And from there, I just continue to listen to my users, to use, listen to the market and see, you know, what are the things the market needs and how can I solve those problems and make this, this completely revolutionary mode of using AI, how can I make it easier, more accessible and more productive for professionals like me? So what are some of the key features that your that you have got the best response from the user base so far that you you like the most that... yeah so people really love the ability to search and filter they you know they they made a chat last week and they they're trying to remember you know what it was or where it was and they can just easily in magi search and filter people love staying organized so in magi we have the ability to have separate brands or workspaces where you can kind of separate clients and so it's not all one giant list of content you've created you can actually separate them out and have some degree of organization they love being able to put things into filters or not filters folders uh, create their own folders and kind of stay organized that way uh, and then and a huge feature which open ai just basically uh copied from magi um is the ability to have personas now, personas are the magic of getting AI to actually produce content that sounds like you, that aligns with your values, that aligns with your brand. 
And essentially what a persona is, is just giving the AI a personality or giving it a, uh, a specific set of instructions on how it should behave in the conversation. So it, best example is I want it to write in my voice and Magi gives you the ability to create a persona based on your own voice and have the AI write in a way that it seems like it came right out of your own head. Uh, and we also have a bunch of uh, pre-made personas, you know, things like expert copywriter or marketing expert or social media manager, you know, whatever uh, goal you have, it's always best to sort of assign the AI a role and tell it specifically what you want. And so what that does is it makes it so that the AI isn't pulling from its huge swath of generalized knowledge. You're giving it a very laser focused uh, field to pull from and you get much better results when you when you do it that way. So that has been probably the most successful feature for our users. And now OpenAI just recently announced that they've got these things called GPTs and allows you to do exactly that. Um, so, well, so I, thought, I thought we'd probably be delving this because you, you were probably well aware of this when you entered this market. Obviously, you were always, I'd be interested in how you dealt with this men mentally working out your business model because it was obvious that there's always a good chance they're gonna you're gonna be Sherlocked, you know. Yeah. Um, no, um, and all the people that are building I was listening to another from Professor G, his podcast, and he was actually talking about this people building products and open AI and being Sherlocked. Um so you were probably quite aware of that yeah risk so so actually in my eyes it's not a risk and here's why yeah, well that's why i'm interested to get your insights about this how you mentally work this out yourself yeah so the 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 problem culturally with us right now is everything's a subscription right and you've got five, 50 different uh streaming service subscriptions and you've got you know, a subscription to your favorite uh, shaving tools. You got a subscription to, you know, your favorite steak. I don't know. People have all kinds of subscriptions. Your favorite coffee. You know, it's a subscription service. So this subs subscription fatigue is a real thing. Yeah. And in the world of AI, there, ChatGPT is not the only game in town. Uh, not by a long shot. In fact, it has its, its closest competitor. Uh, ChatGPT is still trying to catch up in many respects to it. It's called Anthropic, uh, the company, and they have an AI model called Claude, which is extremely sophisticated, may not be as creative in, in terms of like, you know, artistic language that it might come up with, but it's extremely capable. And so what you ha are having in the marketplace is not just, you know, one AI company that's doing all the innovative things. You're having a lot of them pop up. So Google has their own AI that's popping up. Meta is creating their own AI chatbot. And then you have, of course, all the other types of AI, the generative uh, image AI. You got things like Midjourney, Dolly, you have Stable Diffusion and all these companies out there trying to create the best image generator, right? So what Magi's ultimate goal is, is to save people from having to subscribe to all of them. Because inside of Magi, our users get access to ChatGPT, GPT-4. They also get access to Claude. They also get access to Google's Palm Bison model. They also get access to Meta's Llama model. They also get access to Stable Diffusion and Dolly3 and Midjourney and the image generators. So it's, it's not just uh, us building a wrapper over OpenAI. It is us saying, look, you're going to want to use and leverage all of these AI things. And it's great to have them all in one subscription in one unified interface. So you don't have to relearn how to use every single one. Uh, and it's also great to be able to use it in a team environment, uh, which Magi also has plans for teams and you can invite people in. So uh, every time OpenAI makes an update or Claude makes an update or any of these AI companies make an update, uh, all that does is increase the value of the product that we've built because it gives people access to all of the AI models in one unified place. Yeah, I, I love it because I, I suffer from stuff. Sorry, long term. Um, I have dyslexia, so um, I've always listened to audio books and video and podcasting. 
Um, but it's helped enormously with all my, um, it's one of the reasons why I got into tech and web design and development, because I've always been very artistic. Uh, um, and it's just been fantastic, this new technology. It's helped so much and it's saved me a lot of time and um, I love it. Um, so um, on to the next question. Um, what do you think Google's attitude towards content apps produced by AI? They seem to, as always, be giving contradictory statements to some mm -hmm. extent. Obviously, they're using machine learning in their own looking at websites and reducing the need for link signals that's pretty obvious they've been using this for quite a while and they're in a tricky position because if they destroy search they destroy the major money center for the whole business right. so they're in a very very tricky spot so but what's their general attitude because i've been updating content writing new content, utilizing my writer team. Um, some of the content I write for you, AI, Google seems to love. Others, it doesn't seem to index at all. Um, um, it's all over the place. But I found a much more recently over the past six months, a much more volatile situation around content anyway about it seems to be all over the place. So there's a, there were, there's about six questions in one there, Dustin. So <laughs> choose choose whatever. Let's start with what how Google's looking at AI, what content generated generated content. What do you think yeah, that the way they're viewing a, it? I think it's a really fascinating conversation, right? Because Google's in this really existential crisis right now. Yeah. A lot of people are trying to treat. AI chatbots like a Google search, which, uh, by the way, don't do that. Um, <laughs> it's not great at surfacing accurate information. Uh, Claude actually is much better at surfacing accurate information, but GPT, some of the other models, they tend to make stuff up. So don't use it like a Google search. But I think in terms of how Google is looking at AI generated content on websites, um, I too have connections uh inside of google and i have spoken with engineers and they they will often tell you different things um just i think, I think it's done on purpose myself actually yeah well it's some of it's on purpose some of it is just literally like people are working in different departments well some of their in sorry i things. do this hopefully because i'm english i like my quick one-liners well, I think they're, some of their engineers think it's alive already, don't they? So that's they a problem, they isn't do. it? <laughs> yeah, but in terms of content on websites, here's, here, here is where I stand on this. A, uh, Google cannot detect AI content, period. Um, if you're so you mean GPT all that or, money I've been giving to these AI recognition tools, all the money they got, I was wasting my money, Dustin. You are. Uh, I, I will go on record and say... These tools that say, you know, the, the AI content detection, um, not very good. Uh, you can put in literature, uh, you can put in stuff that you've handwritten, and it might get it accurate once, and then the next time get it completely wrong. What they're looking for are specific patterns. And these patterns with more modern AI models, especially with GPT-4 and with Claude 2, and with even this last week's update to GPT-4, it's undetectable. If, especially if you put a persona behind it, if you give it some degree of direction on how to write, it's going to completely um, fool any AI detection thing out there. I GPT think I think you're spot on there because I spend a lot of time researching the topic and I give give it a lot of guidance. Yeah. So it's kind of it it just allows me to write better stuff. It's a tool. It just helps me. Mm -hmm. so much and my team write better stuff but these people that say oh there's certain tools out there and we're not going to name them because it's not right and i don't want to get sued <laughs> that you know you can put in a load of titles and it'll churn a hundred articles out and yeah, give no, sign up for that. this course and we'll, and we'll make you a seven figure fortune 
journey now. Uh, yeah. I don't think you're going to, in my opinion, I don't think you're going to get very far very quick. No, those things have been the... around longer than AI and they never work. And uh, there are lots of technical reasons why they don't work. Um, but I would say, yeah, absolutely don't. AI is really good with iterative approaches. It is, uh, its strength is in short bursts of content. If you're using it, uh, and this is one of the things I've taught all of my users uh, in, in hundreds of conversations, uh, do not give it a simple prompt to have it write 2000 words. That will result in very poor, low quality content. And it's just the nature of where AI is at this given time. The more that it has to write it once, the more sort of low quality it gets. It deteriorates over the uh, longer period of um, having to write. So if instead you kind of prompt it iteratively, one at a time, one section, one paragraph at a time, it focuses all its all its energy, all its uh, intelligence on that short burst, you get a lot better quality out of it. And you can iterate as you go, making it smarter and smarter as the content that you're building goes instead of you know wasting it all in one go. Uh, I have an entire blog post about this, but um, suffice to say, you know, short bursts of content, not huge bits of content. And that's why I think what you'll get is a lot of these these websites saying, oh, you know, I, I wrote this article with AI and, and Google didn't even rank it. Well, you probably had it run a, a ton of low quality content at once instead of really constructing the 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 content. The well, way. I actually do read it, and I edit it, and I but, and I get other people to edit it, and we add things to it, and we get it to rewrite it. And I normally add videos that I produce, podcasts, charts, external. You know, I try and knock up something that's got some value. Um, I think a lot of people don't do that, do they? No, they don't. No, they they want to they want a, an easy button. They want to say, write me an, uh, a two thousand word article about dog grooming, and then they hit the button, and they just want to copy and paste the article. Uh, and that's why I think you know you're getting a lot of sites and a lot of you know experts out there saying, oh, Google detects AI. Uh, this this article didn't rank, and my whole site was affected. Well, you, you put out crap, you know. But I think also at the same time, I think Google's rapidly like i said they're in an existential crisis they have to figure out how to sort of balance their algorithm to uh to take on this new challenge of swaths of ai generated content so i think to some degree they're they're iterating to kind of improve their quality controls so ultimately google's job is to surface the highest quality results right that's their goal that's how they make their money by surfacing the best content for people's queries uh, so I think at times in order to do that and to maybe fight against the the AI generated content, they might be overcorrecting in some instances. So I think what we'll see over the next six to 12 months is, you know, sort of an up and down um, volatility that we haven't seen in Google for a while because they're trying to just figure it out um, and they haven't figured it out yet uh, <laughs> as far as I can see. It's also, it's just me, you're you're much more of an expert on it. I've had to become an expert because I run a business and one of them, I do business to the business outreach and then I have business to consumer and I use content marketing as the main vector that I utilise and I've invested a lot of writers, time, there's over three to 400 articles on the WP Tonic. I do podcasts, two podcasts, three podcasts a week, plus videos. You know, it's a machine, and it's only a three yeah. of us in the team. We're That's amazing. producing a, a lot of content, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but is the, the main contradiction, you know, Google wants wants to see signals. They come to your website, and they, they see that – that they get the information that somebody doesn't go to another website. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, but when I'm searching, even if I get, uh, if I, because there's, to me, there's different levels of searching. I'm just basing it on mine. There's factual information. You do a search mm -hmm. to find a, a fact, mm -hmm. but then there's 
deeper search where you're trying to find out the right questions to ask Mm -hmm. because you don't know the subject. Right. You're you're trying to find out the, the search parameters that you need to know to make decent searches. Is that making sense? Yeah, absolutely. And then you do a deep, when you know about a subject, you want to refresh yourself Make because you know you have to deal with so, especially you're running your own business, you're juggling so many balls that you know you can't keep up with everything, especially tech because it it changes so quick. So you're refreshing. That's other type of search, and then there's influencers or terrible term, but we have to use it. Um, but there's people that you respect their content. You get the feeling that they they're at a higher stage than you, and you get the feeling that they do know what they're talking about. So you you read this stuff because you hope some of their brilliance rubs off on you because you're just a normal guy or woman. Right? Is this mate? Am I on the right track? So there's all yeah. types of searches. And- yeah, yeah. And the the term that marketers have used for for a long time now is intent. You know, we we have different intents, and I think over the years Google's gotten really good at um, ca- sort of categorizing or determining the intent of a query. And that's why, you know, you have things like, you know, if you search for, you know, the term uh, coffee shop, like it knows that your intent is is to find a local coffee shop near you, not necessarily to, you know, find an online coffee shop where you buy coffee. It's not necessarily, you know, I'm looking to franchise a coffee shop. Like it, it figures out the intent. And it's usually pretty good because it has a lot of da- data to determine the intent. And so whether that intent is research oriented or whether it's a fact fact oriented, they've tended to do pretty well with guessing the intent of the user's query. And so you're you're spot on there. There there are different modalities of you know what you might be searching for, and I think Google's gotten really good at that. And the other thing is. I won't name them because they've come after if, um, they come after me a couple of times, threatening to sue me. So I call them the chocolate factory. You won't know what I'm talking about, but there's a couple very large web, WordPress focused websites that you ut- utilize Far Eastern um, content churning farms to knock mm-hmm. out really crap content. Mm-hmm. The most all, but they they regularly dominate because they swamped and they use black hat seo to mm-hmm. and they've ele- but google's just allowed them what it seems that google's attitude seems to be all over the place there's some really awful websites that have great d- domain authority that their content is just awful but they still google just religiously puts them on the top of a lot of wordpress search terms What's that about? Do you got the insight? Well, because I think that you see that in a lot of sectors, don't you? Some really crappy that you use, yeah. and there's this this this, this snobby attitude towards AI. But they were using content mill farms in the Far East anyway for years. So what's sure. the difference? Yeah. So you know, I think the the Google search algorithm is so complex and so nuanced, and some people have just gotten really good at gaming it. Because it's a big business and some people just have a ton of money to just throw into all of that. And I think it's just it's just a matter of like, so quality for one is subjective in, in many cases, right? So somebody might read, and, and this happens all the time when I speak to, or, or not when I speak, when I attend other people's talks on AI. I might be sitting there as the expert going, ooh, that's pretty terrible advice. Um, but the people there don't know. They don't know better. Um, yeah. They're they're new to it. And so, like, I think to your case. You're I saying you're of- intuitively spot on because a lot of this content is aimed at the newbie in WordPress. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen that, you know, grow- coming up in the WordPress space, I've seen, you know, all of these. I think WordPress- you know who I'm talking about. I think anyway. I do. Yeah. Um, so I've seen a lot of these sites where they cater towards the the beginner. And I think because they're beginners, they don't know, you know, how good or bad the advice is. They're just looking for an answer to their query, right? And so Google's job is just to surface the result that seems like most people like. And when you have a lot of cash you can throw at 
marketing and content uh, distribution and you can throw a lot of cash at backlinks and and doing all of the seo things you tend to get up there in the search results and people are lazy so they they may not spend the time to click down to the fifth and sixth thing so if you can get up there in the first three results and you you can get people to stay on the page for a long time you know google looks at those signals like how long do visitors stay are they coming in and out of different results if they stay on one result or one link that they've clicked on, they stay there for a while and they don't come back to the search, Google sees that as a huge signal as that was the right result. That was the right search uh, result to give. For them. understandable as, reasons. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of the, the quality issues that we might see as experts or as highly experienced um, people in that field, the beginners, the, the content that is meant for the people who don't know what we know, it, it, they might not know enough to know that's not very good content. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're in this place of like, we, we know too much and, and therefore, um, you know, it's almost sometimes hard to get past the, uh, our, our own knowledge of, you know, we know too much and therefore, you know, maybe we're not uh, as resourced as these other companies that aren't spending time on the highest quality content, they're able to churn it out faster and distribute it more, more quickly and stay at the top of those results because they're, they're, they're doing enough to get there and they're able to stay there. And I think it's much harder for them to knock them down when they've done all of that distribution and attracted all those beginner, uh, that, that beginner traffic. Yeah, I think you put, yeah, thanks for that. You put that so succinctly. Um, Fantastic. I'm not I'm not being sarcastic here. I thought you did a fantastic job there actually. You clarified it in my own mind because it does puzzle me, but I think it's it's understandable in Google's eyes, really, isn't it? Yeah, they're they're in a hard spot because they they can't sit there and you know the, the algorithm isn't perfect. It's not perfect in, mm. in it can't analyze from an expert standpoint, is this content like is it good advice? You know, is it accurate advice? Is it deep advice? You know, it, it does that to a degree, but its biggest signal is user behavior. Does, really um, does, Black Hat, does Black Hat link farm still work to some extent? Oh, I don't know. Um, I want to say no, but I don't it, have What's said that. behind the scenes is this guy's built a whole um, link farm uh, in the Far East and that's how he... Um, yeah, you know, I mean, you know. I have to think that to some degree, link farms and backlink gaming and buying still works because I will log into my email every <laughs> single day and it never fails. There it never are ends, does it? five new emails saying, we'd like to do a, a link. I never show. replied to any of them, but it must no. work. It must work. Somebody must be replied to these. Right. Uh... And my email app has this fun little feature where when I hit command B, it blocks that person from ever emailing me again. <laughs> so, oh, please I'll don't do that to me. Be, I'll be nice be. to you so far. Right, I think it's time. I think we've had a good chat, actually. Uh, you controlled. I've got a very wandering mind. I think it's around my dyslexia, really. You've con <laughs> that one of those questions was in six parts, wasn't it? But I think you handled <laughs> it. Sometimes I get guests, and it just looks like me, you know, like I'm on. I'm on um, some drug or something, uh, but you, you dealt with it. It keeps things easy. interesting. Oh, very, very tactful. I can tell you're an extremely tactful person. I'm not. I'm, I can be what I want to be. Uh, um, all right, let's go for our break. It's been a great discussion. I've really enjoyed the chat. We will be back in a few moments, folks. This podcast episode is brought to you by Lifter LMS, the leading learning management system solution for WordPress. If you or your client are creating any kind of online course, training-based membership website, or any type of e-learning project, Lifter LMS is the most secure, stable, well-supported solution on the market. Go to lifterlms.com and save 20% at checkout with coupon code PODCAST20. That's PODCAST20. Enjoy the rest of your show. I'm back, folks. Just want to point out, don't forget about our new sponsor, Homersend. It's a really cool 
plugin to send text messaging, especially if you're around WooCommerce. Let's face it, WooCommerce needs some text messaging. <laughs> no, it needs a good solution, and this looks quite good, actually. So go and have a look at it. I'll make sure it's in the show notes and go to the deals page, and it, all the details will be there. Um, I also want to point out, if you really want to support the show, why don't you become a WP Tonic partner? Um, we've got some fantastic affiliate deals and it, you really be showing your support to the show. Um, if you're building a learning uh, management system, a membership site or a buddy boss site, we're great part hosting partners. So go over to wp-tonic slash partners, wp-tonic slash partners and become a partner. We love you to become part of the tribe and you'll be showing your support for independent media. Um, so, uh, on we go on our journey. So, what do you think? I think you touched upon it um, in the first part of the show, um, Dustin. Um, but where, it's really, it's, I'm asking the impossible question, really, but they never stop me. Um, where do you think we're going to be at the end of 204 when it comes to AI? Have you got any, can you rub that crystal ball or just look into it and just give us any feelings that you think we might be at the end of next year? Yeah, so I think there are several advancements that are happening in AI that are going to come to pass within a year or so, My, maybe two to three years. So one of the things that I am simultaneously a fan of and not a fan of are prompt engineering and this idea that you have to kind of find the magic, the right combination. It's all in the prompts, baby. You can achieve <laughs> everything with the right prompt. Right. Um, I, I think where AI is going and where it ultimately has to go, if it's going to continue to move forward, is it's going to be easier to just simply converse with the AI in simple terms and not have to do all this prompt engineering. Um, and there are those who would disagree with me, but I think with, uh, with the iterations that OpenAI in particular has been making in this past week alone, yeah. they're showing us that they are actively trying to uh, help people with prompting by just getting better at uh, being intuitive and understanding the intent, kind of like Google, understanding the intent behind the query and uh, what it does is it kind of rewrites the prompt on the back end. And you'll see this if anybody's used the OpenAI uh, Dolly 3 integration, creating images inside the chat. Uh, it will, in effect, rewrite your prompt in, in better ways. And so I think over the next year, we'll start to see prompt engineering becomes a thing of the past. Uh, you won't hear much about it anymore. Um, and people will just, they'll, number one, people will learn that all I have to do is just be articulate, like just articulate what I want. Well, I've got a slight problem, you know. <laughs> I think you'll be fine. Um, but Not my listeners that, tell me I've got a problem there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so on top of that, like, I think the AI will, will just get better. They'll get better at understanding what we want and we won't have to do all this prompt engineering because it'll do it for us behind the scenes. Um, in terms of SEO, I, I, I don't think Google will get its act together in the next year. Um, just historically, <laughs> I don't think they've done things quickly. They made um, so much money though. Gobs of money. Just yeah. gobs. And they're, but, they're funny old, just, you don't know what to make of them really. Do. I suppose right. when you get a, some of the, most of your company's filled with PHPs, but you've ever worked with a university, you realise because you've got a load of PHPs, doesn't mean any sense is spoken, though, do you? Yeah, yeah, no, and uh, uh, actually, a lot of universities are starting to use Magi uh, because it's way easier to give their students access to all of the AIs with one subscription. Uh, working with the University of Notre Dame uh, recently, and uh, they're doing generative AI. They're actually teaching a class on prompt engineering, which again, I'm a fan of, but I'm not a fan of. I think it's helpful for this current season of AI where people are just learning to, how do I talk to it? 
Um, how do how do I interface with this? I mean, we all went through that with Google, right? We all had to figure out how do I craft a search query, but there was no like search query engineering that happened right there is well there it's no funny that you, you i'm great it's great to hear that you're getting some traction with universities but i actually see ai being a great boon for education because it at the present moment it's saying yeah. oh everybody's going to be replaced and the world's going to collapse but i actually see one of the great areas you know obviously merse and pattern recognition um, is another factor, but in education, because haven't we found with the revolution of information over the past 25 years that we've had all this information there, out mm -hmm. there? Yeah. But it hasn't filtered out in improving a lot of people's educational outcomes. Having all the information out there is great, but you need a teacher, you need somebody to be able and for the elite the one percent they can buy individual tuition they can buy the best right. suitors they can buy the best one-to-one -one. but the rest of us we can't but that's one of the promises of ai isn't it to have a mentor a teacher mm -hmm. that can customize learning to your individual style to increase your ability to learn. Yeah. Or am I totally lost it, Dustin? No, I, I think you're you're ahead of the curve. I think that's that's something that is the most exciting part of AI is having those more personalized and customized experience. So my wife is a teacher. She is a language arts teacher at a, a local middle school. God bless and her. So, God bless her. I could do it. I just yeah, hit no, those kids. I, I just idiot. smack those kids all over the place. <laughs> if they got lippy, if they got lippy with me, I just smack them one. That's I, I've lost half my audience already. <laughs> uh, um, but it's just true. That's why no, I'm not a teacher. I'm <laughs> with you. I'm with you. I worked with teenagers for a number of years before becoming an entrepreneur, and then my wife will come home with these stories of how these middle school boys are acting. I'm like, I would, I would have slapped. I would have thrown them across the room. Uh, I would have definitely gotten fired. <laughs> so I, I don't know how. To, hats off to all the teachers out there. You are so underappreciated. I was a dreadful kid, actually. It was awful thinking back. That's so surprising, isn't it? But, yeah. Uh, so yeah. so I, I'm seeing firsthand how, how teachers are using it to help them with their workload because teachers are always overworked. There's so much to get to, and sometimes they don't have time to come up with an entire lesson plan or quiz, and they can use AI to augment their expertise and come up with stuff faster and be more efficient. But on top of that, they can use AI to sort of come up with these customized approaches to individual needs. So some of her, actually many of her students have, um, I wouldn't say special needs, but they have, uh, they need, they require a higher degree of attention in their educational process. And so she's able to uh, bounce ideas off of the AI inside of Magi and just get some different perspectives, get some different examples to use, or maybe some different illustrations that might work with that particular student's uh, way of seeing the world. Um, I think, all, especially when it comes to mathematics and more technical, because yeah. it's such, um, learning mathematics is a bit like learning music. If you haven't got that innate, Yes, liking to it. It's such a mountain it's to hard. get, yeah. And a lot of hard. people drop out, and we need to get people up to a certain standard. We don't need, you know, if you haven't got that innate liking of mathematics, right? I, I never, I never learned calculus or anything like that because they, they thought I was an idiot. But I've always <laughs> liked, I always liked business math, business math. You know, I've yeah. always been able. To, oh, I can add up pretty quick <laughs> if i say myself uh, um <laughs> so um but i think um in america and in the uk and a, and a few other countries people drop out of the technical subjects because calculus and some of the basic if you're going to do higher scientific you've got to learn those basics and a lot of people find it so difficult don't they because they don't get that one-to-one -one tuition that mm -hmm. the one percent gets because a lot of those struggle but they just get more and more resources thrown at it to get mm -hmm. to a certain standard 
And I, I just see that as being a promise of AI, or am I deluded, Dustin? No, I think you're spot on. Uh, like I said, my wife is using it to to help with the diversity in uh, perspectives and in, in learning styles. Uh, and you know, I think uh, I, you know, I think there are all kinds of use cases that we're going to discover, just like we discovered with Google. We discovered uh, at first it was just like you know, uh, searching for Charlie bit my finger, right? We were just searching for funny stuff, and then we realized, oh, I can search it for the local um, news. I can search for local restaurants. I can search for phone numbers. Oh, I can I can actually put math problems into the Google search bar and it'll calculate it for me. So it's this discovery growth curve that we're encountering with AI where the more we use it, the more we will realize we can use it for. And uh, I think that's, you know, that, that's a pretty exciting and fun thing for me to, uh, to experience because I love learning and I love discovering new things. And so I think, um, yeah, I think you're spot on. And because, because I think it's really important because if we don't get people up to a certain standard, they can't even be part of the discussion, can't yeah. can they? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you listen to quantum, you know, anybody talking about the universe or quantum mechanics or mm -hmm. anything, um, if they start, they tend to have to pitch it at using normal language. And the thing is, if you're dealing with any of these higher concepts around science and that, is that you can't use general language. You have to go into yeah. this. And as soon as you do that, you lose 95% of the <laughs> audience straight away after yeah. about five minutes. So you're back to general terms that are great. Right. But it's so there's a constant problem, isn't there, with a lot of these discussions, isn't it? Yeah. You never thought you'd be discussing that on the podcast. Did you? <laughs> I did not anticipate quantum mechanics. No, no. no there we go. Um, so let's go on. Let's, um, so what are some of the business tools, some of the business tool service you touched on? And I totally agreed with you. It's one of the great things about WordPress is um, because I, I totally agree with you. And it's one of the great things about your product that you were so kind to point out is you know subscription tiredness um yeah you know um love sass um but um i think you've got to be realistic as well about it um but what are some of the products and services that you utilize on a daily basis that you just couldn't you know that i have i have like zoom grammarly um there's about half a dozen that I do subscribe, but everything else I utilize WordPress for. Um, yeah. But what are some of the tools and services that you utilize? So there are just a few that I, I literally could not live without. Um, I am a, a Todoist user. Todoist is my productivity tool of choice. Oh. Uh, I love Todoist. I love their UI. I love the simplicity. Uh, they're, they're, I mean, just masters at crafting beautiful experiences. Um, so that's my to-do list. That's my product project management. Um, I absolutely couldn't live without Slack because I hate email. And so all of my team communication <laughs> happens through Slack. Yeah, I've got a hate love affair with Slack. I, I utilize about, I use it every day with my team because I hate email as well. Um, but isn't, is it me or is it, a, you know, I, it's a dog's breath of the interface, isn't it? It it is challenge. It has its own set of challenges that are, and and the more communication you have, sort of the less helpful it becomes. So thankfully, my my company's at you know it's just me and my virtual assistant, and I just hired two developers to help uh, assist me with the the building. So there's not a whole lot of communication, but I've you know back when I had my first SaaS product, we had a team of I think six or seven. And if you're in there communicating daily, it becomes overwhelming. <laughs> so it it's, I think Slack is ideal for small teams. Can you imagine a nasty manager over you, pinning you through, ding, and he yeah. says, ding, 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 Yeah, ding. no, it can be, it can Sky absolutely be worse than email in a lot of respects. Um, but if you, you know, for me, when, when our team is small, it, it is very helpful. Anything else? Um, Notion. I'm I'm a 
avid Notion user, if you've ever used Notion. That's a religion. What's, what's it? I never got <laughs> into, I never got into that. What's it, what's it about you Notion people? It's like it's like a tech religion. Yeah, so I, I mean, I'm not a, I, in, by any means, I'm not a power user. I mostly use it for like internal documentation, stuff that we wouldn't share outside of our organization. You know, stuff like vision and roadmap, like internal roadmap, that sort of thing. Um, standard operating procedures, you know, it just makes it easier to kind of share amongst the team. But I do geek out every now and then with like Z Zapier integrations. Uh, so I have a, a calendar where every time a new uh, sale goes through, a new purchase goes through, I have a calendar that shows me how many sales per day. Um, and so that's just kind of like a morale booster. You know, having um, a rough, it's stuff like having a rough day and then a few sales come through. Right, and all, yeah. And your day just improves straight yeah, away. Yeah, it changes it? your day. Um, so I have that calendar up. Um, also, I, I'm a, uh, I've, I ditched Google Analytics a long time ago um, for privacy reasons and just, you know, for the fact that it was just so wieldy. There's just so much in Google Analytics. I switched over to a company called Fathom, usefathom.com, and I use their analytics product. And I'm a bit of an analytical sort of guy. So I, as I'm sitting here, I have an iPad set up to the left that always shows my stats and my analytics to make sure, okay, what's the traffic like? Is there a spike? Where are people at? And just kind of monitor things. And so like I, in terms of my business, like I could not live without, you know, having good analytics that are you know helpful and not overwhelming um, but that's about it i mean I, I try to keep my tool stack pretty slim uh if i can yeah i've only got about half a dozen um business SaaS. you know like i say a lot of the other stuff i'm but i've always um you've got some um, wordpress people and they're kind of religious as well and you utilize a SaaS product you know you're going to be this you're disemboweled, you know. For, uh, <laughs> um, but I, you know, there just are some SaaS products that are just better than the WordPress alternatives, you know. Um, yeah. there isn't a good sales, um, the fluent CRM is a fantastic, better in my opinion, than active yeah. campaign. Um, mm -hmm. but there isn't a, a good sales CRM alternative, you know. Um but I'm not a great fan of HubSpot and sell, Salesforce is great, but you know, for the right type of business, but mm -hmm. um, I utilize Zolo for that, even though it's got some rough edges, but I've been utilizing Zolo CRM as my digital hub for years and it does the right job for me. Um, so let's move on. So you, you touched upon the bitter experience of your previous SaaS um <laughs> we've all got those arrows you seem to have recovered you seem quite chirpy uh, uh obviously the sales are coming through with the new product that always helps doesn't it uh it does yeah <laughs> uh <laughs> it makes makes me happier uh um so what are some of the things you've learned um if you could go back like you know what before I go to the tardis question what if you don't mind me asking, if you don't want to discuss it too much, because, you know, it's a bit like a bad marriage, you know, over you get over the bitterness, you don't want to talk about it anymore, do you? Um, what what was the – did you – obviously you thought about, you know, why the previous SAS didn't work out. Um, are there one or two things, conclusions? Was it doomed from the beginning? Was it market fit that was one of the factors? Or was there a yeah. couple of factors? Little tips you could give to the audience. Yeah, so I'm I'm happy to talk about it. I, I think it's as it's as important, if not more important, to talk about our failures than it is to talk about our success. It's depressing though, isn't it? It is. It is, but I think in that in talking about the failures and how you've gotten through it. So again, I was in a very dark place. I was um you know really having a hard time mentally. My wife, you know, family was going through some personal things my wife's health was kind of up and down and yeah. like it, it all kind of accumulated it was like a, well it's a always the same you, you, you never it's one it's dealing with one problem is but you right. always get it, it, you always get six problems and they right. come out it, they, they, they come out the, you never even saw it coming did you yeah. yeah so you know when I was in that place 
hearing about all these success stories was just making me more depressed because yeah. it was like, why can't I, I'm seeing everybody else succeed, but me, but then I would get this, this glimmer of hope in seeing somebody talk about their hardships and how they made it through them. Um, rather than just talking about the success and it gave me hope. So I have no problem talking about my absolute failures because hopefully it helps somebody out there who is in a place where they need to hear some hope. So for me, the two product ideas that I had, I'd been sitting on for years. And ultimately what it came down to was I had this great vision for uh, w- one of the products in particular that was light years ahead of its time. But the the development cost of bringing that full product to life would have been multiple six figures. Uh, I mean, I was talking about doing AI things with imagery before you, you just couldn't go down to San Francisco and find these these VCs that are just waiting to They're give you seven you, figures. Right? Just yeah. you know, you know, give you like a runway of seven years. <laughs> you mean you couldn't right. find that? Justin? No, I've been a bootstrapper. I've always been a bootstrapper. I've never taken venture capital. Uh, never taken on investors. You know, I always been kind of like a you know, let's grind it out and see if I can do this myself. So. The, this idea that I had was was AI before AI images was a thing, but it was going to cost so much money and I didn't have those resources. So what you find yourself doing as a, uh, as a product creator is you whittle it down. What is the minimum viable product that we can build that will kind of get us some of the way there and maybe allow us to build further? So the idea was come up with the simplest form of this idea to get enough people to buy into the idea. That's quite good. What was the matter with that? What was the matter with that? Yeah, well, fund the development, right? But the problem was uh, the money was short and uh, the the minimum viable product just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And when we finally whittled it down to a place where I could afford to have it built because I would have to outsource the development, um, when we brought it to market, it took more money than than we anticipated and it took more time and by the time we got the product out the value that it gave was not enough to attract the audience so we didn't have the product market fit and people just didn't get the value of it Uh, they didn't see the vision for it and you know you you can't just sell people a vision and hope they will just pay you only if only they would get the vision what's that if only they would get the vision. Right, if they would get the vision. Some people did get the vision, and I had a, a very small group of you know people who believed in the vision, but you know, not everybody can afford to bank on something that may come to fruition, right? Some people are like, well, I need to do things now, and if you don't have the thing that I need now, then I'm going to go use this other thing. You know, it's very hard to dissuade people from Canva because that was pretty much my competition was Canva. Oh, dear. Um, oh, yeah, I'll get the picture now. <laughs> Yeah. So um, I was up against a lot and it just, we never found the product market fit, never found the user base to support further development for it. And so it just kind of fizzled out. And um, it was a hard lesson, uh, a hard lesson in, you know, just find first finding what that product, instead of whittling the product down and saying, what's the least amount of product that I can build? Um spend way more time talking to your customers and saying, what is, what is the one problem that you need solved? Um, starting with a vision and working backwards can often be very cerebral and very self-focused as an entrepreneur. We have this idea of what we want to build. And, you know, you have the Steve jobs mentality out there that I tend to lean towards where it's like, you know, if I ask people what they wanted, you know, I wouldn't have built the revolutionary product that I built or, you know, the Henry Ford example. If I would have asked people what they wanted, they would have told me faster horses. Yeah, I think it's a, I just think it's a mixture of both. It, isn't it? And it is. It's a nuanced mixture. Sometimes if it was one that, or the other, it's like most things in business. Um, that's why, you know, I love chatting with people, but I don't read it. I listen to a few business book um, type books, but I don't, I don't because by the time... It, there's too many variables. There's too much grey in this. Yeah. You can, you, there's certain practices that I think are best practice, mm-hmm. but it, there's so much grey in these business journeys yeah. that and you, you have can't to become, take too much from it, can you? Right. You have to become good at balancing, you know, what you think the market wants and what the market is actually telling you they need. Um, and you have to meet the needs before you 
exceed and teach them something that they didn't realize they needed. Right. So that, that was the hard lesson that I found, you know, it's a balance of meeting their needs where they're at, but also you know the other thing that a lot of people don't you know what I've come to the conclusion, Dustin, which none of us like. What's that? You need a bit of luck. A little bit. Yeah. Luck does help. Timing is very important. Uh, I think it all goes into uh, all, all goes into the mixture of, you know, how fast, how far you go. Yeah. We don't like, you know, obviously hard work, dedication, knowing what you're doing, having some idea what you're doing. But the one thing we don't like is you, know, you need a little bit of luck, you know, mm -hmm. and it might be you just didn't get the break, the luck. So it's simple. So let's go to my final question. You've been a very gracious guest. You dealt with me superbly, actually, does. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm obviously from the UK, the suburbs of northeast London. I live in America for the past 15 years, but I'm very, very English still, I've been told. My relatives, my close relatives in the UK reckon I've become Americanized, though, but I don't think so, <laughs> do you? Um, so I'm a great, I was, a, as a kid, a great fan of Doctor Who and the TARDIS, the time machine. So if you had your own TARDIS and you, own, you could go back at the beginning of your business career, is there one or two, you can consult yourself, what is there one or two tips, insights that you would love to be able to have told yourself? Um, I would probably go back to, I, I don't know, 2005, 2006-ish. Uh, tell myself, buy all the Bitcoin. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the first thing. Buy, buy the Tevo. The Go and buy Tevo. That's a sensible thing to do, isn't it? It's amazing they've kept on going, those people, isn't it, Tevo? They're yeah. still going, aren't they? Everybody else got it. But those, yeah. those, drug, um, those, those drug dealers need a way to move their money, don't they? <laughs> I suspect that's true. Um, and I think the other thing is... That's just got me a letter. I'm going to be sued now again. <laughs> you can see why I regularly get letters, can't you, Dustin? Do you get them at physical letters in the mail? Yeah, I've had a few. They're actually, you can't see them, but I, I, I treat them as trophies, actually. <laughs> that's wonderful. Uh, uh, but, you know, but in terms of business advice, I guess I would say, you know, Fight the chocolate, by the more. way, the chocolate factory sent me free. Did they? <laughs> I mean, because it doesn't stop me. I, I get worse, actually, about them. Um, I called the founder Willy Wonka, and I called the company the chocolate factory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, sorry, oh, I put you off, didn't I? Yeah, uh, no, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, I was thinking about Willy Wonka and how I want to watch that movie again now. We actually have a board game. Um, my kids and I love to play. It's uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Um, yeah, it's, it's like a lot, you know, um, we all have a deep side of ourselves that we don't want people to see. But I, I sense, I might be totally wrong, but I sense you, you're, you know what you project publicly is what you get privately. And I know it's, I know this is horrendous, I'm very like this in person, right? <laughs> you know, but there's other people, they're totally, their public persona is a total sham. Yeah. And Willy Wonka's the same, you know, he makes yeah. out, he's friendly, he's always smiling, and he isn't in private at all. <laughs> um, um, so that's just life, isn't it? You, as you get older, you realise there's a lot of people that, that charm People mix friendliness with um, shallow charm, and they're yeah. two very different commodities, aren't they? Yeah. So uh, being in the world of social media marketing for a lot of years, there are plenty of people who fit that bill. And uh, you know, with your Willy Wonka example, you know, he's 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 friendly and and uh, maybe a bit eccentric publicly, but uh, you know, as as they might say in uh, where you're from, behind the scenes, he's another. He is an absolute nutter. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, Justin, I, I'm, we're a bit, we're a little bit over the hour. I'm very respectful of your time. You need to get back to getting more sales, as we all do. It's been a pleasure discussing this with you. What's the best way to find out more about you, 
more about the company and more, you know, generally. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's I, I love this conversation. This is going to be the highlight of my day. I've had a lot of fun here. Uh, the best way to learn more about me and what I'm doing with Magi is just head over to magi.co, M-A-G-A-I dot C-O. That's fantastic. We, we've got some fantastic guests coming up in the next couple of weeks, and then I'm having a couple of weeks off. Already got some great guests for January. I've really enjoyed this discussion with Justin. Hopefully you will come back sometime in the new year, later in the new year. I would love um, to. That's great. I think we've covered some interesting stuff. I've enjoyed the discussion. We'll see you soon, folks. Bye.